Welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. As we together reread the Aubrey Matra novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, would you please help us out with where we were last time and where we might be getting to this week? I would be delighted. Thanks, Ian. Well, last time, Sophie told Stephen that Jack is the only man she'll ever marry. Stephen confessed his love for Diana back to Sophie. Diana and Sophie had a fight, which we heard about from multiple perspectives. Diana told Stephen she did not want him as a lover, but that if he kept pursuing her, he would absolutely regret ever being with her. Killick joined the ship with lots of food gifts from Sophie. Jack entertained Canning and his officers now that he had a little food. Stephen grew closer to McDonald. A French informant came and was immediately dead. Hart was angry that Jack hadn't seized a prize. Stephen retrieved his boots while it turns out Jack was away seeing Diana. And Stephen smells her perfume on Jack. Uh-huh. Jack, yeah, Jack delayed his convoy in order to see Diana some more. And Stephen <sighs> worried that if Jack kept going ashore, he was going to be arrested for debt and really hoped that he would leave immediately with this convoy. This time, we see what happens on the convoy. Jack assesses the crew. He has an opportunity to re-rig the polycrest, and he displays an unusual talent. We learn about new sales, Stephen's unusual talent, and see an old enemy. Jack, once again, has an opportunity to come through for Admiral Hart. Ah, it's, uh, well, Mike, it's not quite the mammoth scale of the last couple of chapters, but we've got a lot riding on what could happen this chapter, I think. It's going to be really fascinating. Now, we're, we're back at sea, and we've talked about this all the way through the book, right? People sometimes read this book and fret for the absence of seagoing action and all the time that we spend ashore building up character and plot and stuff. But we are back at sea. And if you're waiting for some action, then don't hold your breath for too much longer. Um, We're at sea with a convoy, the convoy that has been taken all the way down almost as far as Lisbon Rock turns from the polycrest with a fair bit of loathing. They're actually happy to be no longer held back by this rather sluggish performer, the Polycrest. Polycrest had actually held the convoy's initial departure back. They had missed their tide. She had held back their sailing all the way down with her slowness and her sagging to leeward. Polycrest had run into and carried away the bowsprit of one particular ship at night, had rolled her own mizzenmast out and was sailing with a jury rig. All this, and as it turned out, no raiders, no privateers, the convoy had never needed any protection. And so the, the atmosphere is a bit sullen as we come to a Thursday and it's time for muster. Only a few of the new hands still don't quite know why they need to be at muster. Uh, and we have the nice scene here, Mike, of the, uh, the, the, the muster revealing the competence and the loyalty and the kind of fellow feeling of the whole range of different characters in the ship. And it's not a very happy picture. The letters A through G as we go through the muster of surnames. This first sort of third or so of the alphabet contains pretty much all of the able-bodied seamen, even some of the awkward brutes like this fellow called Bolton. The wasters of this particular group, even they can hand reef and steer. But once we get past H onwards, the rest of the alphabet covers only two able seamen and all of the others, the balance of the crew here, are not happy. They're surly, they're apprehensive, maybe from being flogged and started. There are 87 men and boys in total, which is 33 short of compliment, and only 30 of them know their duty, while all the others are at least making a bit of progress, but there are still some real bad characters. Three of them, these brutal, wicked men, whose names come right at the end of the alphabet, Wright, Wilson, and Young. And this number of untrained and even discontented men is way too many for a small ship's company like this. And as they disperse, Jack looks across at this crew and wonders prophetically how many of them would follow him if he had to lead them onto the deck of a French man of war tomorrow. And Mike, lots of jeopardy coming in this chapter, 
first of all, there's some jeopardy for Jack and his usual kind of moves, which would be taking and boarding, right? Right. Exactly right. But, you know, it, it's it's interesting, as, as happened several times in this chapter, you know, Jack's in kind of a little bit of an uncomfortable situation and he immediately turns to the rigging. And yeah. so it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to go to my safe spot, my my comfort zone, if you will. And today, Jack is leading the whole crew in re-rigging the polycrest. Now, Admiralty regulations, we point out, completely forbid this. Jack can't shift so much as a backstay on his own volition, but the storm that they had gone through in the Bay of Biscay had already shifted the backstays and a good bit more. So Jack's thought is, given all this storm damage, hey, I got to fix it, so I'm just going to fix the polycrest while we're at it. He yeah. wants to stop the ship from being so over mass and to rake her foremast forward with a system of stays and jibs and staysels to make her less crank and to try to relieve this griping. Now, the nice thing is, even though this small crew, the professionals in this line of business are very helpful and really good and well-trained. And he's even finding out that some of his press men and bounty men have skills from onshore that are quite helpful here. Uh, they're going through this pretty much all day. At 4 p.m., Pauling says, you know, should I send the hands to dinner now? And Jack says, no, no, no. You know, you wouldn't want to look like proper flats where Frenchmen to be sighted any minute. He's saying, you know, we're going to have to wait and you know, sway up this main top mast first and clear the deck of all this stuff we have out here so that the ship can be worked. You know, right now they're sailing along, but they really couldn't do much else than that. So slowly they raise this great iron hooped 40 foot column of wood, which is, you know, swaying every time they're rolling like this enormous, dangerous pendulum. And as it gets closer to the end, and you were mentioning the jeopardy and the tension, you know, re yeah. even reading this scene is just like going into battle. You know, it says there's a point where a top rope parting or a block spindle failing would be fatal. It says that this big bass would plunge down like a gigantic arrow, go through the deck and then through the ship's bottom. And as the text says, sending them all to their long account. So meaning they lose the ship and all yeah. hands. But in those last minutes, it all finishes smoothly. And then Jack gives the final little cleaning up orders and says, yep, then we're going to pipe to supper and splice the main brace. So, you know, Ian, it, I, I can hear you saying grog for all hands. I think this is absolutely this is what's coming here. <laughs> and we get a little bits of narrative, little bits of uh, ceremonial here that we're going to come back to all the way through the canon, splicing the main brace. The whole little performance with the launch hoe and banging the fit in when they set the top mast, that's kind of one of the signature routines that seem to represent a fairly well-ordered and happy ship and a resourceful crew and a resourceful jack. So it's a nice little high moment here for seamanship and readiness. And Jack is feeling pretty benign. Later on, he tells Stephen how pleasant it is to see the sun. He's happy to be dry and warm after all the months of English drizzle up in the channel. And Stephen, who's looking down a tube thrust deep into the water, doesn't hear him. Stephen also notes the warm weather means that the water is warm. And rather offhandedly, he says, oh, I've, I've been feeding this shark that's been following us along here. I've been feeding goblets of decayed flesh. He's swimming under the ship. And this could be just a little whimsical Stephen moment, but the jeopardy really ramps up because at the same moment, we get a scream as one of the ship's company falls from the yard, hits a backstay and bounces into the sea. Jack orders the ship to head into wind and dives overboard. It's Bolton, one of those early alphabet guys that we talked about before, grabs Bolton by the pigtail. When Bolton panics and tries to thresh away, he tells him to stop and clasp his hands and stay still or the shark will get him. And this deep-seated fear of sharks somehow compels Bolton to lie very, very still. The word shark, says the text went home, even to that terrified, half-drunk, waterlogged mind. Bolton clasped his hands as though the force of his grip might keep him safe. Bolton stays rigid then until a boat picks them up. They're both rescued. And Bolton sits there, confused, obscurely ashamed and stupid in the bottom of the boat. 
So again, this is going to be something we're going to see again, Mike, the signature move of Jack Aubrey rescuing people from over the side. Uh, Bolton is carried aboard and taken below to be checked out by Stephen. So later on, this saving a man overboard feat becomes part of the conversation between Jack and Stephen. Stephen passes congratulations to Jack and honors him for jumping in immediately to save Bolton. Jack says, well, yeah, it's pretty good, but I'm looking at the rigging. He says that at the rate the work is going, we'll have the Bentinks bent tomorrow. And he gives a little ho, ho, ho at his own wit with that very, very lame pun. Stephen, he says, did you smoke it? And Stephen wonders whether this is a self-conscious bit of lightheartedly pushing away the recognition of this rescue. Is Jack making light of the thing? Is he being boastful? Is it a kind of arrogance? Is he actually embarrassed? And when he realizes that this um, sort of dismissal of the heroism of the act is just as natural to Jack as his attempt at a pun, he kind of starts to think, well, what does this mean for, for Jack and the, you know, his, his view of all of these deeds? Stephen says, weren't you afraid? And he's thinking about the deadly attributes of a, of a shark in the water. And Jack says, uh, by the way, again, a phrase that we're going to hear from Jack again in, uh, in the future in the canon. Ah, sharks are mostly gammon. He says, all cry and no wool unless there happens to be blood in the water. He says he dived on to the back of one particular shark, saving a man in the West Indies. And Stephen says, well, talk to me about this saving men by pulling them out of the water. Does this happen frequently? Isn't this something, he calls it epochal, isn't it? Something very memorable or special. And Jack says, well, now that you mention it, I suppose Bolton is number 22 or 23. The humane chaps, he means the guys from the Humane Society, had once sent him a gold medal. But of course, that had been taken to the pawn shop in Gibraltar. And Mike, besides being a really fascinating bit of characterization for Jack, this is an interesting bit of connection to one of our uh, one of our background heroes, right? It's fascinating. We think that so much of Jack is modeled after Thomas Cochran, but apparently parts of Jack come from Sir Edward Pellew as well, including this attribute of saving men who have fallen overboard a number of times in scenes just oh. like this in Pellew's history. And one in, in 1796, where an East Indiaman, the Dutton, which had more than 400 troops aboard, as well as many women and children, ran aground. The seas are heavy. The crew and soldiers the passengers are unable to get to shore and Pellew swam out to the wreck with a line and then with some help from an Irishman rigged a lifeline that saved almost, uh, you know, everybody aboard. And he was actually awarded a baronetcy uh, in, in that year for that wow. feat. So, you know, fascinating. There's a, I, I don't know if we want to pop it out and there's a, a, an interesting uh, Daily Mail article about a guy who's researching Pellew and realizing, oh my gosh, there's a lot of Jack Aubrey right, in this right, guy. Right. Jack Aubrey's not just a facsimile of of Cochrane. He's uh, he's his own character, right. of course, but he's got these aspects of Pellew about him as well. Really, really fascinating. Jack says there's, there's really nothing to pulling people from the water once you get used to their grappling. He says, you know, you feel good and worthy, but it really don't signify. Um, and then Jack says, uh, I'll quote the text here, I should go in for a dog, let alone an able seaman. Why, if it were warm, I dare say, I should go in for a surgeon. Ha, 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 ha. And, you know, I, boy, this this kind of, I thought, oh, on happy days, this would be fun. You know, a little joking remark. But I wonder now with all the tension between them, it's these little things. I'm thinking, how's Stephen taking this? How's Stephen taking this? But Jack, again, kind of blows it to the side, turns to give Mr. Parker orders for the rest of the rigging for the day, knowing that, you know, Parker's all worried about the decks being a who and wants to pretty yep. them again. And Parker begs the captain's pardon for not having received him back aboard from the boat in the proper fashion. You know, he didn't, oh my gosh, the captain's coming aboard. And uh, he offers his congratulations on the rescue. And Jack says, you know, he thanks him. He says, an able seaman like Bolton, one of their best upper yardsmen, is a valuable prize. And Parker says, well, Bolton was drunk. That's why he fell. And he's on my list now. And Jack says, well, maybe you can overlook it just this once. And, and I, I kind of thought, you know, with everything else going on with Jack and some of his decisions that I really don't understand, this is kind of like the Jack that I think of more. 
I think he's already seen the reaction that Bolton had to this, you know, how he reacted. And I think Bolton's already putting this together in his mind. And Bolton will probably change his behavior based on that. But if he gets flogged now for something like this, yeah, he'll be back to the same surly, apprehensive, right. yeah, it's it's me against yeah. them. Not, wow, boy, the captain rescued me. You know, I didn't get called out for this. So I think, you know, Jack, the leader is is almost naturally, uh, probably unconsciously, endearing a good man to him yeah. and hopefully wins his yeah. loyalty. One, one seaman at a time, maybe he can rescue and turn around the, the mood of this, this trick. Right. Thing. Huh. Ooh. Well, this is a really, really fascinating passage. And we get Stephen's perspective on it later on. Stephen says, if Jack deprecates his own rescues, then perhaps others will in turn not value them and he'll get no gratitude. This is part of a further conversation with Jack. And Jack says, yeah, you're probably right. Some people, and he mentions Bonden in particular, who in, in the timeline allegedly has been rescued by Jack sometime in the past, but we're pretty sure we haven't seen it. Some people then, like Bonden, are really appreciative. Most of them think it's no great matter, which is perhaps the same attitude that Stephen is noticing in Jack here. Jack says, well, he wouldn't value it for himself unless it was a particular friend or someone who knew him and jumped in to rescue him because the person knew it was him and that's why they were jumping in. So presuming that the act only becomes special and noteworthy when there's a personal connection is something that Jack is sort of picking up on here and mulling over. And he concludes that in the case of pulling people out of the sea, virtue is its own reward. And it's kind of a fascinating thing to think about and compare with all the other things that drive other bits of habitual behavior at sea on, and on land by Jack Aubrey. Let's maybe come back at some point to the idea of Jack appreciating that a particular friend rescues Jack, then it will be because it's Jack and there's some silence and Stephen, I love this moment, Stephen declares, hmm, I've decided I'm going to learn to swim. <laughs> Now, we have to kind of take this a little step at a time because this whole conversation is woven in and out of a parallel conversation that Jack is kind of having almost with himself about getting these Bentinks drawing. And he's not really paying attention to Stephen, even though Stephen's quizzing him on quite a deep level. He keeps coming back to these sales rather than thinking about what Stephen is asking about. So, Mike, we'll, we'll come to Bentinks in a moment here, but let's talk about this right now. Stephen thinking that he wants to learn to swim. It, it, it's super fascinating. I had read straight past this at like 50 miles an hour when I think I first read this chapter. But what do you think is going on there? Stephen saying, perhaps I'll learn how to swim. Perhaps I don't want to be saved. Perhaps I don't want to be saved by you. What do you think? Yeah, I, I wondered exactly the same thing. And because he says, you know, I am determined. I am determined to learn how to swim. And I thought, what is driving this incredible conviction in the midst of this conversation with Jack. And like you said, I don't want to have to be saved. I don't want to have to be saved by you, or I want to be able to be somebody who could do right. some saving. <laughs> in the case, I don't know what makes him so determined here to learn how to swim. So this whole conversation in, in, in the midst of a very action-packed chapter and everything else with Jack kind of distracted by the sales, and let's come back to this bed takes, It's still, I thought, all right, there's a reason there's always a reason O'Brien has put a scene like this in it and come back to it and dug into it so much. So I, 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 what do you think? Uh, well, I think this this one bears a reread. So if you're listening with us now and you haven't lately had this chapter in front of you, go back and reread or re-listen to this passage of Stephen and Jack talking about the rescue. It's really great writing and it's so clever. If you know what's happening in the rest of the book, how... All the way through, up, up to this point, in fact, all the way through the first 10 chapters of the book, O'Brien's digging these really, really deep foundations for, for what's going to happen in the closing chapters of the book and also in the whole of the rest of the canon. We're going to get to see the pretty surface works, including bear suits and benting sails and all the other bits and pieces. But what's really fascinating is the deep foundations he's laying for the characters. And he's trusting us as the readers to see what lies beneath because we're in, there are going to be moments coming when we're not going to get very much of the surface works at all to go on. <laughs> oh. 
Anyhow, Mike, let, let's talk about Bentinks for a minute since we've used the word a dozen times already. <laughs> this is completely dropped in here. No actual explanations given in the text at all about what a Bentink is. And in fact, there is potential confusion if you're going to dig into this for yourselves because uh, a British Navy captain by the name of John Bentink had invented this particular form of uh, sail, basically taking a square sail, a square course or a top sail, and chopping away the two bottom corners so it comes to a point in the middle. So it's an inverted triangle with a straight edge horizontal at the top made to a yard, and then a single sheet or a single clue line to this point of the triangle pointing straight downwards as a way of making a sail with less surface area that could still be flown from a yard. Um, there are a whole bunch of other things that Bentink invented. So if you go searching for anything to do with Bentink, you'll see Bentink shrouds and Bentink, all kinds of other things. But this guy was clearly a bit of an innovator, probably would have been good friends with Jack Aubrey, I think, given the interesting kind of seamanship about what's going on here. And uh, Bentink was clearly also on O'Brien's mind because really earlier on in this book, Sophie uh, had mentioned that she had a, a newly engaged friend of hers who in turn was called Sophie Bentink. So this fellow Bentink was clearly on an index card somewhere within reach of O'Brien as he was going through the chapters of this book, Mike. Yeah, and we're not done with Bentinks yet. The next day, McDonald tells Stephen, the Bentinks are drawing, the Bentinks <laughs> are drawing. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Steve Martin. The new phone book is here. The new phone book. <laughs> yeah. you know, Stephen, yeah. Stephen asks, well, I, I hope the captain is well pleased. And McDonald says, oh, he's delighted. Stephen says, well, he's glad because he hopes he does not have to hear about all these jibber jibs and nautical yeah. jargon that the captain's been going on and on about. And, and I love the pot calling the, the kettle black. You know, Stephen says something about... You know, sailors are all well and good, but they do use a lot of jargon, unlike Stephen, who no. never uses <laughs> any jargon, right, scientifically. Right? But, you know, Stephen is, as is, is they're having this conversation, Stephen looks down at McDonald polishing his pistols, and uh, he compliments him on, and he asks if he minds if, if he can handle one. And McDonald says, ah, Joe Manton made these for me, and he asks if pistols interest Stephen. And Stephen says, oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, when he was younger, he delighted in pistols and small swords since he says he went out, meaning he was in duels, much more than than Englishmen, as he understands it, did in, in his youth, as perhaps he says, you know, you did, McDonald, thinking Scottish. And McDonald says, well, you know, often, what do you mean by often? And Stephen says, oh, you know, say 20 to 30 oh. times a year. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh you know, 20 to 30 duels a year. And then Stephen has this line. He says, and at that time, I attached perhaps undue importance to staying alive and therefore became very proficient yeah. at both. <laughs> and I was like, I think Stephen says moderate proficient, but he's, you know, well, we'll come to that. But this, I, I was like, what, what do you mean undue importance to staying alive? You don't have, you don't think that's important right now. I understand you're feeling bad in this whole thing with Diana and Jack, but wait, just don't do that. But Stephen says he has a childish longing to be at it again, back at pistols and small swords. And I'm also thinking, what? Wait, wait. Well, McDonald invites him, you know, he says, come on, practice with me up on deck. And Stephen says, well, I don't want to do anything irregular. He says, no, no, no. I trained my Marines on, you know, on other ships. I've trained the midshipmen. You know, this is very regular. And so wow. I'm like, wow, where, where is this going? But I, I did notice, you know, I know we've talked about Joe, you know, the gun maker yeah. before. So, you know, if for people who followed us all the way through, just a quick reminder, but for people who are new, maybe a quick word about Joe. Malcolm yeah. Manson. Joe Manson probably, at that time, the most celebrated maker of high quality sporting guns, sporting guns, and also clearly guns for 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 combat as well, for dueling in this case. Um, I'm pretty sure you can still buy as really valuable treasured antiques, Joe Manton uh, pistols and rifles, and maybe even muskets as well. These are precious items that McDonald owns, and that Stephen is going to have a have a have a turn off here. So, having talked the talk, we also get to walk the walk, and there's this training duel now between MacDonald and Stephen Maturin. First, they fight with swords and the midshipmen and anybody else who's uh, 
around to be distracted from their duties is entranced by what O'Brien calls the venomous, wicked dart and flash of these two men thrusting and parrying at each other until they're exhausted. When Stephen says, enough, I'm done, I'm tired, MacDonald says, well, from my side, I'm a dead man 10 minutes ago, so you're pretty good at this. And Jack importantly notices, uh, all of the people noticing here, Jack is the one, for the sake of the story, who needs to notice. And he notices for sure. I had no notion, he says, that you were such a man of blood. And MacDonald says, you're, you're not kidding. Um, you must have been uncommonly deadly when you were in practice, adding that Stephen can say anything he wants to him. He'll never duel him. Like he's never going to call him out for any kind of remark. Call, you know, call me whatever you like. I'm going to leave you well alone. Which is a lighthearted remark, a bit of praise from MacDonald, but oh, you don't want to cross Stephen. Next, they turn to try pistols. And Jack is still watching. He is amazed as Stephen practices his marksmanship by shooting the pips out of playing cards at 20 paces, which I'm pretty sure is pretty good marksmanship. Now, Jack, until this point, hadn't realized that Stephen knew anything at all about guns. And at one level, he's quite happy. He's very pleased to see his friend is doing well. And he's noticing the respectful silence across the deck and a little bit sad that as captain and presumably a reasonably steady shot himself, he can't join in this competition. But that sort of positive admiring feeling gives way to something a bit darker. He says he was obscurely uneasy. There was something disagreeable and somehow reptilian about the cold contained way Stephen took up his stance, raised his pistol, looked along the barrel with his pale eyes and shot the head off the King of Hearts. Jack's certainties wavered. He turned to look at his new bentinks, smoothly filled, drawing to perfection. <laughs> and Mike, I, I think we talked about this in our previous read-through, right? That it's no coincidence that it's the King of Hearts, the, the, the male character full of love, um, that is the one getting his head blown off as Stephen practices. I wonder who that could possibly be who are we thinking could be lined up for some jeopardy here? Do I have to draw you a diagram? I don't think so. <laughs> it's fascinating then that Jack, for it is, for it is he, um, needs to look somewhere for a bit of comfort and a bit of familiarity and solid ground. And that's why we've been fussing around with the Bentinks this whole time to give Jack something to hang on to for surety and reassurance. Now, there are all kinds of reasons, I think, why Stephen Maturin is being built up as somebody who has surprising levels of kind of martial skill here. Some of them are sleight of hand. Some of them are outright deception. But we'll we'll come back to this whole thing of Stephen the warrior at the end of the episode. Nice. Nice. Well, the next morning, Jack's still asleep. But even in his sleep, he knows that there's something not quite right. And he's not surprised when the midshipman runs in and reports Mr. Pulling's duty and that a sail has been sighted. And Jack has a hard time making out the sail. And he compliments Pulling's on his eyesight. You know, apparently, it's you know, they, they can't see very well. It's not good visibility. And Pulling says, well, the ship had fired one gun earlier and I yeah. caught the flash. So... He was alerted to where it was. And Jack thinks, well, that means the ship has you know, a consort or two and is firing to tell them to tack when they tack. So Jack orders the wind hauled. And then as they're sitting there, he finally catches a glimpse of one sail, possibly two, sailing on an intersecting course. Jack takes the wheel and, and for the first time is testing out the Polycrest with her new rigging plan. And she lays almost five points off the wind, much better than her former six and a half. And Jack thinks, well, with a careful hand at the wheel, you know, we could eat the wind out of any stranger right now, even with this extravagant leeway of the polycrest. So Jack turns the wheel over to Haynes, saying that, you know, Haynes would oblige the captain with what he calls a double trick at the wheel. And then he instructs him, dice, do you, do you mind me now? Not a hair's breadth off. And Haynes replies, aye, aye, sir, dice it is. And I, I remember listening to this narration going, dice, dice, what is dice? And so, you know, I turned to my steady, constant companion, the Patrick O'Brien Muster book, which says, oh, dice was an editor's typo, should have been written just so. And I thought, yeah, 
I don't know how you get dice out of just so, even if in O'Brien's handwriting. Now, Dean King, C of Word, says dice is another word yeah. for thus. And, and, and Jack had said thus earlier. But running to a little more obscure reference, Teak Marine Woodworks Nautical Terms Glossary says dice is keeping the attitude towards the wind as it is and no higher. In other words, if the wind changes direction, change the course to match. And Ian, you, you've actually, you've experienced this. This is the real yeah. world view. This is just all Yeah, exactly. In, in, in a boat being sailed for leisure or being sailed for racing, s- sailing close hauled, what you'd normally expect the helmsman to do is to get to follow the wind and keep the boat as close to the wind so you're making ground to windward as much as you can. So if you're in that world, then giving a specific instruction to do this feels a little bit odd. But of course... Big big sailing ships sailing sort of d- direct courses from one place to another might not necessarily always have a helmsman who's expecting to do anything other than follow a compass course. So it just means follow the wind, and when the wind backs a little bit, you bear away, and when the wind heads a little bit, you can luff up and ba- make the best that you can. Interestingly, having had Stephen showing his skill as a swordsman and as a pistol shot, now we've got Jack and a skilled quartermaster uh, showing great skill. By the way, the bosuns had great skill as well, rigging the rigging the boat to get the, the the performance out of it like this. This is really, really great. The Polycrest, as commanded by Jack Aubrey, is a different vessel now, and she's got some capability. Ah, so Jack, meanwhile, goes below to rate, to rest to take a turn, but he can't. Uh, this is a little signal that Jack's got things on his mind now. Even though the Bentinks are drawing well and the boat is sailing close to the wind and he's got his whole scheme laid out here, something is bugging him. And he normally can sleep like a log. This time he can't. Back on deck, we see these two or three ships tacking by signal in the dark of the moon. They could be anything at all, but he notices an incautious light showing on one of these ships, suggesting that at least that one is a merchantman. Jack now knows, because of the sailing performance that he's getting out of the Polycrest, that he'll have the weather gauge by dawn. Now, by 4 a.m., they know that it is, in fact, three ships. They're now on a parallel course. Polycrest has got a perfect weather gauge set up. She's dead in the eye of the wind from these other three ships. Jack orders the galley fires lit and a substantial breakfast served out for the crew before the ship clears for action. And... We get a little bit of this sensation of anticipation for us and, of course, for the crew. And we are sort of sitting down at breakfast, as it were, with some of the old Sophies and some of the new hands. And the oldsters are telling the newbies, you're going to see the captain cut one of his capers on these here foreigners. And the new men, one or two of them, are a bit sceptical going, well, I, I was promised all these dollars and all this fortune and I haven't seen anything yet except being kicked and started. So I'd, I'd kind of like to see something. And... In the light, as the dawn breaks, Jack sees all three ships just a quarter of a mile away. There are no great sailors. One of them is jury-rigged. Jack climbs up in the top to get a better look and calls to Pullings to come up and join him. Pullings confirms what Jack has seen. One of the ships is none other than the Bellon, and she's now escorting two Bordeaux merchantmen. The Bellon is clearly interested in finding out about this odd triangular thing, this polycrest, as potentially a prize to go alongside the two consorts that she's escorting. Mike, it's all about to start aboard the Bellon and the polycrest here, as well as the hands being sent to breakfast. What do you say? Maybe we should go and grab ourselves a slice of something from the galley. Yeah, I think so. And for you people who thought, wait, this is Jane Austen on shore too much, don't worry, strap in. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. We're back. I hope you had a little something pleasant or, you know, you got the taste of salt on your (laughs) lips and you're ready for some action here. And Jack knows that despite the balloon's speed, he's going to have the initiative for the next, at least the next 10 to 20 minutes. It's going to be up to him, bring him to action or not bring him to action. He's thinking to himself, well, the balloon has 34 guns to our 16. And 
it was interesting because I was I was trying to do the math here. I thought, wait, wait, Texas 24 can't be. That doesn't work out. So it's, it's 16, which the text had said earlier, not the 24 that it says here, at least in my version. But 34 to 16, but the balloons are eight and six pounders. So a combined weight of metal of 126 pounds compared to the Polycrest 384 pounds with these heavier short range carronades. But the Balloons guns can hit the Polycrest from a mile away, and the Polycrest has to come within pistol shot to fire effectively. Remember Stephen and Jack talking about this earlier. And even closer than pistol shot would be better, could do much more damage. But if they get too close, they, with their you know poor, uh, small, uh, inexperienced crew, risk being boarded by 200 to 300 well-trained highly experienced privateersmen. So fascinating the way the Jeopardy is ramping up, ramping up here. Right. And, and we're going into Jack Aubrey making ready for action here in true Cochrane style with a bit of deception. He has the Marines take off their red coats. He gets people to fling sailcloth over the guns in the waist so that they can be whipped off in a flash. He's placing empty casks on the deck to make the ship look, as he says, like a slut, which is, by the way, something that clearly doesn't make Lieutenant Parker terribly happy, who would really like her to look more like a princess. But there's a nice little comic moment with Parker's dismay at all of this. And Jack is delighted to be seeing the Bellon here with the rolls reversed. The Bellon could be taken by the Polycrest, by the ship that Jack is in command of, rather than vice versa. And he loves the sound in his mouth of the word taken. Jack calls all hands aft. He says, I know this privateer. She only has six or eight pounders behind her gun ports. This privateer is going to pepper them as they edge down. But as he says to the crew, it don't signify. When they're so close that they can't miss, he's going to give them a broadside. Every gun should be aimed low at the enemy's mizzen. Five minutes brisk, he says, and she strikes. Don't fire until the drum beats. And Mike, like like you said, if you've been worried about all the carriages and corsets, uh, Jane Austen action so far, we're about to get deeply back into action at sea here. Right, right. Well, Jack sees Stephen and cries, good morning, and he's smiling with great affection. He tells Stephen, aye, that's our old friend, the balloon there. And Stephen says, yeah, Pullings told me, so you mean to fight with her? Jack says he means to sink, take, burn, or destroy her. So then Stephen reminds Jack about his watch and tells him all the specifics about it, as well as three pairs of drawers. So if we get the balloon, I, I want my watch and, and drawers yeah. back. <laughs> is the... I, I love this. Yeah. So I'm going down to the Orlop to get ready to uh, sew up your folks, but be sure you don't forget my underwear. As the day dawns, the merchantmen crowd towards the privateer. So these consorts are getting closer to the balloon. And Jack tells Parker to lay the hatches and for McDonald to get his best marksman ready to go into the tops at the last minute and says, I want you only to sweep the enemy's yeah. quarter deck. So don't fire all over the place. I want you to you know, get rid of the officers there. Jack plans to stay to windward, keep the balloon guessing about their identity. Are they a neutral? Are they a merchantman? Get close, batter her, and you know the whole time try to take the wind out of her sails by his positioning here. Now, he realizes I, I can't do anything complicated with this inexperienced crew and I can't even hide some of my men below, which he would love to do to make yeah. them look like a very easy prize. But he thinks, yeah, you know, these people having never been in battle, they probably wouldn't come back up, you know, when this thing firing starts. So, wow, it's going to be an interesting situation. Yeah. And the ships are edging closer to each other. And every hundred yards of closing the distance means one minute less that they'll have to endure the long range fire from the Bellon here. Finally, the Bellon decides she's going to fire one single shot along the Polycrest side. She raises the English colours, which of course is a, is a ruse de guerre, and hails the Polycrest and shouts, shorten sail and heave to you infernal buggers, which is probably in a comedy French accent, I think we're meant to imagine. You know, your father was an amster. <laughs> Anyhow, Jack has the helmsman blunder a little bit and kind of play the fool, and they raise the Papenberg flag. We'll come to that in a second. And 
this is just to, to, to puzzle them for a few more moments, a few more yards of closing the range. Jack has a sail raised and the Bellon then ra- finally raises the French flag, shows her true colours, turns and fires. And now we're into it. Three balls strike the polycrest side, but the rest fly over her. So most of the broadside misses. Jack orders the master to put the polycrest alongside the Bellon at pistol shot so we can get to it. The colours are raised, the canvas is flung off, the casks are thrown over the side, and both sides here are now, as we said, showing their true colours. Now, can I just talk about the Papenberg flag for a minute? Because this is another one of those delicious things. I, I read it my first couple of readings thinking, oh, that's just some flag of some duchy somewhere, and I paid no account to it. But this time, because we're reading it for the show, I dug into it a little bit, and it's really fascinating. Papenburg was a small city-state. I'm going to say a German city-state, even though the country of Germany didn't exist at this point, part of the kind of legacy of the Holy Roman Empire. This small German city-state that was in the process of becoming part of the uh, the Duchy of Hanover, part of the kind of region of Lower Saxony. And its flag was used as a kind of flag of convenience by trading ships who were from the Low Countries or from other parts of Northwestern Europe um, and who wanted to be able to shelter under the assumed neutrality of this tiny state of Papenburg. Now, Papenburg, under the duke that was kind of taking it over, was what you might call leaning Bonapartist in these early years, the very first couple of years of the, uh, the 19th century, leading up to the War of the Fifth Coalition in 1809, when it would formally become part of Prussia and then get defeated by the French. But at this moment... It's quite a nice double deception. It's a nice idea that a ship wanting to look French neutral to others would raise this Papenburg flag because that would have been a kind of convenient flag to use for that purpose. So therefore, the extra layer of deception is that's a nice move for Jack Aubrey to pull to create the impression that he's creating the impression that he's creating the impression, if you if you know what I mean. Um, We've got a few lines of interesting explanation about the Papenburg flag and how it was being used in slightly dodgy ways by different participants in different sides of the war. And we'll put that out on our social media. Anyway, Mike, that's enough of flags and history. We've got action to get into, right? Right. Well, Jack's watching this and he's afraid. He's thinking, oh my gosh, if the blown tacks and crosses my stern and tries to catch the wind while hitting me from a distance... My plan might not work here. And he's praying for it to fire a broadside at him. You know, don't go try tricky maneuvering. Just come straight at me. Yeah, do the Nelson thing. And the balloon does. She fires a broadside, a ragged one. And now he thinks, ah, the privateer is committed to a quick finish. The polycrest comes down while staying just so in relation to the wind and the balloon. So it's, his plan is working. Jack sends the Marine sharpshooters aloft and has everyone lay down as the balloon fires mostly grape in the next round. And I thought, oh, brilliant scene from Master yeah. and Commander of the movie. So, uh, you know, a Russell Crowe <laughs> alert here. And Jack reminds the crew, all right, now wait for the drums, fire at the mizzen. And Jack times the, the last roll perfectly as they're within range, cries fire, and the drum is drowned out because the polycrest broadside goes off as soon as Jack says it here. You know, we don't even get to hear the drum. The smoke clears and Jack sees this murderous effect, exactly what he was thinking about with these genuine smashers. There's a great gaping hole in the below side. Her mizzen chains are destroyed. The mast is wounded. Three gun ports are beaten in and there are bodies across her quarter deck. And Jack tells the crew once more and she strikes. I'm thinking, wow, this is going to be pretty quick with that wicked balloon that Danning's modeling his privateer after. Wow, wow, here we go. So they fire as ordered, but the balloon doesn't strike. In fact, the captain is still alive and well and waving his hat back at uh, Jack and shouting some kind of orders to his crew. Jack realizes that For all the polycrest has been sharpened up in her performance, she still makes leeway like a son of a gun, and she's drifting down toward the private ear. 200 Frenchmen are already massing for the moment when the ships might touch so that they can board the polycrest. This is absolutely not what Jack had in mind. He tells Goodridge the master to luff up, but both ships' broadsides fire at once, covering his words, and now the ships are yardarm to yardarm. Jack raises the order, 
all hands to repel borders. And he's standing there in the forecastle with 20 or 30 men, which is probably all he can count on, right? Going back to the beginning of the chapter with his 20 or 30 men waiting to hear the ships grind together and wondering what's going to happen when these two or 300 bloodthirsty privateersmen come over the bulwarks there. In the smoke, he hears orders shouted in French. He hears cheering and then a rending, tearing crash. And we don't know at this point what's going to happen until in the next paragraph here, the smoke clears. There's brilliant light. The balloon is shearing off. Her mizzen has gone by the board, thank heavens. She can't keep to the wind. The fallen mast is dragging her stern into the eye of the wind, acting like a huge rudder, swaying her ship's head away from the wind. Jack orders everyone back to the guns because maybe now he can rake her. The Bellon's stern turned towards them. Someone hollers that she's struck falsely. And meanwhile, the disorganized gun crews aboard the Polycrest are running around. Their discipline's broken down. Their supplies are everywhere. They're cheering. They're capering like halfwits, as it says in the text. Jack orders Pullings and Babington and Parker to get the guns firing. Jack reaches out and knocks two men's heads together who are capering and gets them back to their guns. He himself runs guns in and out and fires into the open stone of the Bellon while hollering at Goodridge to bear up. But Mike, the Bellon is not the only ship that's having difficulty handling itself here. No, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm following this thing and it's like, it's this and that and this and this. Now the Polycrest won't answer. And Jack looks around, he sees there's hardly a sheet of her head sails remaining after the last broadside. And she's griping again and won't pay off with the helm hard over. Now they get some shots off and they try to make repairs rapidly but the balloon has now squared her yards and is right before the wind, and they're separating at about 100 yards a minute, a quarter mile away before the polycrest could pursue her. And Jack orders two carronades into the bow, and he sees that the balloon is still being hampered by her trailing mast. And he orders Parlo to fetch him a glass. To, and his, his has been damaged in this last thing, has been broken. And, and I love this tiny moment in the midst of this chaos of battle. A glass? What glass, sir? <laughs> the little pale day's face peered up, anxious, worried. Any glass? A telescope, boy, he said kindly. In the gun room. Look sharp. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, with where Jack's mind's got to be in this action and this little parslo that we've been following, what an ability to turn on a guy to get parslo to do what he yeah. really needs him to do rather than just screaming and hollering him. And then now Jack looks over the ship while he's waiting for this glass. And despite the damage, he's pleased what he sees of the rigging and the crew and the carronades. It's yeah. like, wait, these folks who are brand new, despite everything that's happened, they're doing all right here. Wow. Now, moment of hope here for Jack Aubrey, but our gaze goes back across now to the Bellon. What's happening with her? She's cut away her starboard mizzen shrouds. She surges forward, no longer held back by the mizzen mast. But then her main top mast lurches twice before pitching into the sea. They gain on her. One of the Polycrest's bow carronades fires and almost hits the Bellon on the ricochet. So they're closing the range so they might be able to bring her to action again. The crew is cheering. Jack thinks, well, you'll be cheering on the other side of your faces if the Bellon can put her helm a lee, present her broadside and rake us at a distance with her long guns. Ha, huh. but she doesn't. Focusing his new glass as brought by Parslow, Jack sees that that last lucky shot had unseated her rudder, so Bilon can't steer. She can't do anything but sail dead downwind. So for now, Jack can pursue this chase without having to worry about being peppered by the long guns from the Bilon. The merchantmen are still on the scene. We might remember this, that there were two merchantmen being escorted by the Bilon. The Polycrest is about to pass within a cable's length of them, and Jack gets a moment here to wonder if they'll fire on her with their five gun ports per side. They don't. They edge away to the north, and as the Polycrest gains on the Bellon, Jack wonders whether he should just content himself with the merchantmen and go back and take them. They're a prize after all. In five minutes, he knows they'll be hard to work back to, and in half an hour, they'll be gone forever. Meanwhile, a shot, a lucky shot from the Bellon, comes low over the Polycrest's deck. 
killing a seaman near the wheel, throwing his body over poor little Parslow, which sounds like a really grisly scene here. Jack pulls the body off, says to Parslow, are you okay? Lieutenant Parker reports that the merchantmen have actually struck. And Jack tells him to see if it's possible to lace on a bonnet. If I can get some more speed going, he says, we can hammer the ballon with the broadside again. And Mike, it feels to me like that that chance shot killing the seaman close aboard and the situation with Parslow seemed to have resolved Jack. He's out for revenge or for whatever you'd call it on the Bellon, this privateer. He's going to leave the merchantman behind. Right, right. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, oh my God, Jack, Jack, no. You know, your crew wants the money. Hart wants the money. You need the money. You're going after the Bellon. But hey, maybe he'll get them both. Let's see here. Well, they sweep close to the merchantmen who let their sheets fly in submission. I'm thinking, okay, all right. So there, you're staying still for a minute. And even with the guns firing back and forth between the polycrest and the balloon, with all the bodies on the deck, with the blood running in the scuppers, many of the crew of the polycrest's eyes glance wistfully at these fair size prizes. And they're thinking to themselves, 10, 20, maybe 30,000 guineas on these things? And they know once the polycrest has run a mile away, these ships are going to haul to the wind and they can kiss their fortune goodbye. And I'm thinking, no, no. Well, what happens? The two ships run for hours, never more than a quarter mile apart, firing steadily. The least damage to either would be decisive and the least respite would be mm. fatal. So this is, you know, absolute nip and tuck for both ships. Both try every trick in the book to gain an advantage, including starting their water over the side. The balloon appears to be throwing their supplies over as well, but then Jack realizes, no, 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 it's dead bodies. 40 of them, he counts, once he realizes. And by noon, the mountains of Spain are on the horizon, and the public crest is making water fast. The balloon is steering again using a cable veered out of the stern port. And trying to make one turn, the drag of her cable costs her 100 yards. And the Polycrest master gunner sends a ball smashing into the balloon's stern tracer, this thing that's been doing so much damage to the Polycrest. And the Polycrest people are sheer, but really, Jack sees the Polycrest is turning to run for a Spanish port close by that is going to be open to the French and closed to the British. So this is it. If she can get in there, it's game over for Jack and the Polycrest here. Yeah, grim stuff. Now, there are some miles still to go, and we see something we're going to see a lot in the can, and people throwing things overboard. This time it's the Bellon. She's throwing her guns overboard to try and win back the 100 yards or so that she's uh, that she's lost. The wind is right aft. She has only her head sails, so Jack knows that this lightning ship is only going to do her a little bit of good. The lookout of the Polycrest hails to say a Spanish frigate has been spotted bearing for a Gijon. This is the Spanish port on the Bay of Biscay that they're in the vicinity of. It should have been sighted long ago, but everyone's been watching the chase. And to add further to a complex evolving picture here, there's suddenly an explosion on the polycrest. There are shouts, there's a howl of agony, and it's a burst gun. This overheated gun burst, killing the gunner, wounding three others, and work goes on quickly to replace the carronade while they're being peppered by their muskets aboard the Bellon. The Spanish frigate is close enough now to be within range. She fires a gun and raises a hoist of signals. Damn her, says Jack. And by the way, repeats the same phrase just a little bit later. The Bellon now tries to get some kind of steering going on by veering out a heavy cable to get herself to turn to port just a little bit and also to make ground towards the entrance to Gijon as the Bellon, despite all of this, heads towards the rocks. Jack orders the guns to be trained up forwards and to be fired at the Bellon's mainmast and orders Goodridge to bring the ship up. The polycrest swerves violently, its slide slanting toward the privateer. Her guns go off in succession. Damage is done to the Bellon's rigging now. There are gaps in her mainsail, her yards tilt, but she keeps running. And Parker reports that meanwhile that Spanish frigate is firing. Jack sees that she's altered course to try and run between them and the Bellon. 
Another bit of damnation here, Jack says, damn him, meaning the skipper of the Spanish frigate, I think. He takes the wheel. He puts the ship before the wind and heads straight for the Bellon, hoping that he's going to have one more chance to put a broadside into her before the Spaniard closes the range. One more chance to cripple her before she clears the reef and makes it into the open channel for the port of Gijon. Jack gives his orders, ignores the hail from the Spanish frigate, spins the wheel himself, thinking, if the Spaniard catches the broadside from me, that's his affair. He's putting himself in the position. The guns go off, and the Bellon's mainmast comes down. All the canvas comes down with it, and in a minute, she's in the surf. Jack catches a glimpse of the Bellon's copper, the copper covering the underside of her hull, as she drives further and further onto the reef in two great heaves. She's lying there on her side, and the waves are making a clean breach over her. And Mike, this is a really striking moment, not only for the kind of terror of the situation of this ship being run ashore, but also for how, how deep has Jack got into this action? He disregarded the prize money opportunities of the two merchantmen. He's been kind of monomaniacal chasing the Boulogne. We We can read it in the text. He's got no time for distractions. Uh, incompetent gun crews, damn them. Spanish frigate captains, damn them. He's damning everything in his path. He's pursuing Bellon to its really grim and, for Jack's purposes, unprofitable end. Who knew, Mike, the good old Goldilocks, easy-going, lucky Jack, was capable of this kind of focus? Jack tells Admiral Hart that he drove her on the rocks and he wanted to go in and burn her at low tide, but the Spaniards protested against it because the Bellon was now in territorial waters. They told him the blown back was broken. She's hopelessly bilged. And Hart summarizes, well, Aubrey, you know, you left two valuable merchantmen, a biscuit toss away to chase this blackguardly privateer, which you did not take either. He says that there's so many reports of ships driven on the rocks and bilged only to appear as good as new the next month. And no one gets any head money or gun money out of any of them. Hart says it's all the fault of Aubrey's damn full sail plan, as he puts it. He says <laughs> if you spread your top gallons, you would have had plenty of time to pick up the merchants and then knock the hell out of the bugger you claim to have destroyed. And he says he has no notion of these bentics in anything but a gale wind, meaning, you know, perhaps a different bentic, the storm sails here. But Jack tries to explain that they had been essential to his working to windward of the convoy and that on the polycrest, a greater spread of canvas would only press her down. And Hart gets into full puffed up admiral mode saying, oh, so are you saying, Aubrey, that the less sail you spread, the faster you go? And he looks at his secretary, <laughs> Hart's secretary, and that gets a good laugh out. And Hart says, you know, your sloop is peculiar enough without as the text says, making her look like a pox cocked hat, the laughing stock of the fleet creeping around at five knots because you don't choose to set more sail. So we're we're getting completely dressed down from Hart here. Well, Hart returns to the Dutch galleot that ran away from Aubrey, one of the Boulogne's consorts. He says the amethyst picked her up. And boy, we're getting this repeated story here. You know, Aubrey, you left a prize and the amethyst gets her again, which means that Seymour had at least a 10,000 guinea prize and Hart once again gets nothing. He says he's deeply disappointed in Aubrey. He says, I gave you a cruise and a brand new ship and you're coming back not only empty handed, but half destroyed. You've got five men dead seven wounded, a tale about driving a privateer on a more or less imaginary set of rocks, and you're clamoring for a refit. And he also doesn't want to hear all about this twice laid stuff, all the polycrest bad construction from the corrupt dockyard. He says he also has heard all about Aubrey carrying on ashore and reminds him that a captain is not allowed to sleep out of his ship without permission. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. <laughs> all the venom from Hart that Jack thought he'd face, you know, from his former dalliance with Hart's wife, you know, when he made that first appearance, and now it's coming out now that Jack is not making the Admiral any money. But Jack doesn't take this lying down. He's not meek and mild here. No, he doesn't. He's straight back in Admiral Hart's face. Am I being reproached, he asks, for sleeping out of the ship? 
And Hart backs off saying he never said that Aubrey had. He kind of realizes that he's got a little bit of a tiger by the tail here. Never mind. He comes back with this very kind of teenagery, yeah, yeah, but what about fling back at uh, Jack Aubrey? He says, yeah, but your, your topsails are a disgrace. Why can't you fill them in a body? We'll talk in a minute about what that looks like. Why can't you fill your topsails in a body? And it seems to Jack now that Hart is just being spiteful, that he, if he ever had an opportunity to really bite, he's not taking it or he's too scared to take it. Jack knows that only crack frigates with a full expert crew would fill their topsails in a body rather than in the bunt if they were in harbour or maybe just for a, for a review at Spithead. And so the difference between furling in a bunt and furling in a body. Furling in a bunt means you take a sail that is made fast to the yard along its top edge and it gets folded and rolled such that most of the body of the sail is in the middle toward the mast and the the, the less amount of canvas is out at the ends of the yards. And it's a more natural, perfectly serviceable way to stow a square sail, but it's easier. It's less time consuming and you can also release it quickly. Filling your sails in a body means neatly kind of flaking out or rolling them around the yard so that they make a nice, even, consistent diameter parcel around the yard. And it looks kind of slim and neat and tidy. It's much more time consuming. doesn't really have any purpose apart from looking nice. And of course, it's going to be more time consuming to let the sail fly if you need it again. So I'm, I'm with Jack. I think this is a very silly bit of you know, spit and polish spitefulness from Admiral Hart here. Well, picks up Admiral Hart. I am disappointed in you, as I say. You will go on the Baltic convoys, and the rest of the time, I dare say, the sloop will be employed up and down the channel. That's more your mark. The Baltic convoy should be complete in a few days' time. And that reminds me, I've had a very extraordinary communication from the Admiralty. Your surgeon, a fellow by the name of Maturin, is to be given this sealed envelope. He is to have leave of absence. And they have sent down an assistant to take his place while he is away and to help him when he sees fit to return to his duty. Ha! Huh, I wish he may not give himself airs a sealed envelope. Forsooth. End of chapter nine. And, and Mike, I'm knowing a little bit about what this fresh duty and this sealed envelope for Stephen, what it kind of foretells. I'm a little bit annoyed that it's Hart who's taking us to this next stage in the story here, but he's clearly a malevolent force um, directed against Jack at the moment. He is. Although it, it kind of was fascinating to me that, you know, Hart's all put out because he doesn't know anything about this. And I wondered early on with that, you know, the French informer who had died if Hart was in on that a little bit clearly he's not close enough or important enough to be into any of this intelligence stuff which makes sense to me yeah what a full full chapter wow yeah not not so long in terms of word count and thank heavens for the action right for those of us who've been kind of yearning for a bit of a bit of powder smoke it's been really really exciting but it's to be honest, it feels really, really uneasy. All of this drumbeat of discontent between Jack and Stephen, they're not just any longer at odds about Diana. I think there's a growing rift between them just about their behavior. Jack is remote and fickle, and Stephen is noticing it and calling it out. Jack doesn't seem to be paying Stephen any mind at all. It's really, really unsettling if you know these two characters and you know how close they are. Even worse, I think Jack is getting an inkling of what could be at stake here. Yeah, yeah. I think Stephen crossed or insulted appears to be very deadly. Yeah. And and this growing awareness of Jack's, of who Stephen is, of Stephen's real capabilities, has grown throughout this book from Stephen rescuing him now twice from debt collectors through the whole Stephen leadership and the bear suit trek. And now Stephen's cold reptilian killing machine competence I think that's pretty amazing. And I, I suspect increasingly unsettling for Jack. Right. It's certainly unsettling for the rest of us. And it's, it's really noticeable, the contrast in this chapter between Stephen showing and flexing the skills that he's got with the sword and the pistol versus Jack and the crew of the Polycrest. Like they've had a successful action, but that's not because they're skilled, competent, practiced warriors. They're still finding their way and they're, a, you know, they're not entirely competent yet. And 
as well as some things in Stephen's skill set that are being, oh, how to say this without spoilers, that are being set up for what's coming in later chapters. We're seeing, I think, a real muddying of the waters of the roles here between Stephen and Jack. It's no longer clear which one of them is the warlike warrior hero, which one of them is going to be able to demonstrate their skills to advantage here. It's funny, as as I was reading the passage where the Belon comes close and touches and they might have boarded, I was wondering, hey, is, is this a moment where Stephen Maturin's going to step into the breach with the small sword and take care of a couple of dozen of the Belons? It was a real moment for us to be not sure, I think, about where Stephen's role sits here. Yeah. And, and I think in the hands of a lesser writer, in the hands of a, what are today's action film, they would have been swarmed with these privateersmen. Stephen would have vaulted over the backs of a few people. And to your point, you know, taken out 50 of them and run the rest of them back to ship or something. Not, not here, not in O'Brien's writing. You know, we're just deeper and deeper into real life and real relationships. And, you know, what actually happened in, in historical timelines, as well as what looks like that. I mean, O'Brien has done such a masterful job of describing the actions here, both the human actions, the ship actions, the battle actions, the rigging actions. I love it. And it was fascinating to me here at the end of the chapter. I mean, with all the jeopardy going on here, I, you know, I, I couldn't help but notice that little bit more tweaked at the edge with Hart backing off, you know, Hart had, he, he backs off, but, you know, it's clear that he had hoped to make a lot of money off of Jack. And I think some of that hope is coming to the end. It's like, okay, fine. Yeah. Off to the Baltics with you here. Jack thought that Hart would work to destroy his reputation. And at the moment, even though Hart doesn't look that capable, you know, the way he backed off of Jack's, I'm thinking to myself, Hart doesn't have to be all that capable. I think Jack is making Hart's case for him. Jack keeps screwing (laughs) up here. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know what's getting into him some, but I'm not sure. Why do you keep doing what you're doing, Jack? Right. I mean, he's got all all kinds of incentives in his life to shape up and and, and make smarter decisions and do a better job. But... He, he could use the money. He's deep in debt. Surely he knows that. That, of course, is connected to his possible future happiness with Sophie. Why is he risking this? Why is he giving up on all these opportunities? Why is he making bad decisions? And what about his very, very kind of lightweight, never really mind attitude to saving life as well? And what does that tell right. us about how he's at and how he's feeling about himself and how he's feeling about life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That match with Stevens. Oh, yeah, I used to have an undue childish, you know, desire to, to remain alive. I'm like, oh, my God, neither of our heroes are in a great place right now. Well, yeah. in, in looking back too, I was so sucked into all this action and I had to stop and think, wait a minute, we haven't heard much about Diana and Sophie and life nope. ashore. We do hear that Stephen appears to be headed ashore as Jack heads off for the Baltics. And a sealed envelope for Sooth. It sounded to me huh. like, you know, a potential Mission Impossible envelope for Steven. And, you know, I'm wondering to myself, okay, do we have an intelligence mission coming up? Is something going to happen with Jack in the Baltics? I, I just figure there's only one thing for it, Ian. What do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? Mike, I should like that of all things. <laughs> Pounders behind the gun ports. He's going to pepper the surprise as they edge down. No, I'm going to go. I'm going to roll back because it's not the surprise. It's the polycrest. Oh, right, right. God, I'm so glad you did that. I'm, I'm going right along with it. Right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs>